here. Thank you to the interfaith group that has brought this program. I know that Second Baptist Church has been doing a Black a, um, a Martin Luther King program for a long time. And I know that there's been an interfaith program for the last three years. And so I thank you for inviting me to be a part of it. And I thank you for that introduction. And I'm going to get right into it. Part of the reason I want to get right into it is because there's always much more information than there is time to talk about that information. So I want to make sure I get into it. But the other reason is, uh, sadly, I would like to stay for the whole program, but I have another program I have to get to um, at um, just before two. So I want to make sure that I have time to talk to you guys. And also, um, I, I am in, a, I have to uh, be at another lecture. So thank you all. And I'm going to start my, my lecture today is Black History and the Legacy of Dr. King's Vision. Now, all of us can attest to the fact that King's vision has impacted all of us and has changed world history. Um, his activism, his speaking, his ideas, and his philosophy has impacted the way that we move throughout the world today. However, King doesn't just impact us. King himself is highly impacted by Black history. So Black history is informing King as he's going through his movement as a civil rights leader. And not only is he highly impacted by Black history, he's highly impacted by Detroit's Black history. And so we're going to talk about the com coming together of all of these things, Black history, particularly Detroit's Black history, and King's vision, and how King's vision is widened by his understanding of Black history outside of the Southern freedom struggle, but particularly his interfacing with the city of Detroit. So. Um, when, when Dr. King begins coming to the city of Detroit, he's not yet a civil rights leader. Now, um, when he's 16 years old, um, he comes to Second Baptist Church. It's 1945. His father is, um, the, is going to deliver the guest sermon that year, and it is um, during the time of the National Baptist Convention is in Detroit that year. And so his father, who is Martin Luther King Sr., will give the speech uh, or the sermon uh, the guest sermon at Second Baptist Church. Now he's 16 years old, uh, it's 1945. What's going on around him when he comes here to the city of Detroit? Well, the Burwood Wall was built in 1940, just five years before that. And so the, the World War II is ending, but the Burwood Wall was built at, uh, in 1940 to separate a white housing development from where black people live. So you have housing segregation in Detroit at such a high level to the degree a wall is built on the west side of the city of Detroit. There's a Sojourner Truth battle in 1942 in the middle of World War II, where African Americans who um, are moving into a housing project that was built by the federal government to house African Americans who work at industries that have defense contracts. So these aren't just African Americans who are moving there. These are black people who are working in any of the industries that are producing war material for the federal government. And of course, a white mob is blocking them from moving in. Um, and so there is a battle at the Sojourner Truth Housing Project in Nevada and Fenelon on the northeast side of the city of Detroit. And there's a wall on the northwest side of the city of Detroit. And then, of course, in 1943, there's a Detroit race riot. So just two years before King is, is with his father at Second Baptist Church, there's a Detroit race riot. And of course, it's one of the most bloodiest race riots at, in the 1940s. And, and prior to 1943, it was one of the bloodiest race riots in American history. And of course, um, 34 people are killed in that race riot, um, 25 African-Americans and nine whites. And the reason why so many African-Americans are killed is not because you know, Black people were just victims in this race riot. Black people were fighting uh, in, that, in that race right just as much as they were being attacked. And so um, Black people were defending themselves, they were fighting. So it was not that Black people were just warred upon. Eight whites are killed, I'm uh, sorry, nine whites are killed, because this is a race riot in 1943. This is not whatever we want to call 1967. Um, it is a true race riot. Black people are fighting white people, white people are fighting Black people, if your business is being attacked, it's being attacked by someone of the opposite race. They are not black people looting black-owned businesses. They are not white people looting white-owned businesses. This is a race riot. 
which begins at Belle Isle, and nine whites are killed by African Americans, and eight white eight African Americans are killed by white residents or white civilians, but 17 black people are killed by members of the Detroit Police Department. That's why the numbers of African Americans are so high in that, or the casualties are so high, because white police officers have joined the race riot and they've chosen a side, and that side is on the side of the white community. And so there are police officers in Paradise Valley that are shooting black people as they're coming out of their businesses, as they're going down the streets, and so they're being attacked and they're also not being protected as white civilians are attacking them. And of course, in 1944, you got the McGee case. And so Orsel and Minnie McGee, um, who move into a home on the west side, um, there's a lawsuit to remove them from that home because of the racial restrictive covenant that prevents African-Americans from owning the home. This case will go all the way to the Supreme Court in 1947. The Supreme Court will rule in the Sykes versus um, McGee case, which ends up becoming a, a part of a larger civil rights case that racial restrictive housing covenants cannot be enforced by the government. So that we're beginning to um, make waves in attacking housing discrimination. And so King is 16 years old, coming to a Detroit that is dealing with all of these issues. And then of course, he's gonna come back as an adult to be a guest, a guest minister himself at Second Baptist Church in 1954. And when he comes back in 1954, what's going on then? Well, Black Bottom is being destroyed. And so, uh, but at this point, he's graduated from high school. He's, um, he's now graduated from Morehouse. So he's got his bachelor's and now he's about to get his doctorate. Um, so he, he comes here in, 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 a number of times in 1954. Uh, he speaks twice in Michigan in February um, and in March, he even speaks, but we're going to talk about his speech at, at Second Baptist in 1954. And so he starts his speech. Um, Reverend Simmons, platform associates, members and friends of Second Baptist Church. I need not pause to say how happy I am to be here this morning and to be a part of this worship service. It's certainly with a deal of humility that I stand in this pulpit so rich in tradition and history. So what is he talking about? He's referring to the history of Second Baptist Church as the first black church in Michigan and its history on the Underground Railroad and its history in the Civil Rights Movement. And so he's very aware of the richness of that history that people who were fighting freedom fighters in the 1800s had formed Second Baptist Church as a faith center, but not just faith, but faith and freedom. So it's faith and freedom that's occurring in this space that he's about to speak in. And King is not yet a civil rights leader. He's not yet, not yet led any civil rights campaign. And he's already paying homage to the, that history of Second Baptist Church. People who were about faith and freedom, but not only that, they were about education because it would be here that the first black school, the first school for black people in the city of Detroit would be founded in Second Baptist Church. And so then he goes on. Second Baptist Church, as you know, has the reputation of being one of the great churches of our nation. And it is certainly a challenge that for me to stand here this morning to be in the pulpit of Reverend Banks and of a people who are so great and rich in tradition. I'm not exactly a stranger in the city of Detroit. I've been here several times before. And I remember back in about 1944 or 45, and we already know it was 1945, somewhere back in there that I came to Second Baptist Church for the first time. I think that was the year the National, the National Baptist Convention met here. Now King is referring to the great ministers of Second Baptist, especially Robert Bradby and A.A. A. Banks. King speaks of his first time visiting Second Baptist when Bradby was the pastor during the National Baptist Convention. King was only 16 years old at that time. And of course the environment in Detroit, I described what was, had been going on in the city of Detroit in the past few years before King arrived. And then he goes on. And of course I have a lot of relatives in this city so that Detroit is really something of a second home for me. And I don't feel too much a stranger here this morning. So it is, a, it is indeed a pleasure and a privilege for me to be in this city this morning and to be here to worship with you in the absence of your very fine and noble pastor, Dr. Banks. Now, King's aunt, his father's sister, Woody Clara King Brown and her husband, Jerome Brown and their children, they all live in Detroit. 
Also, his father's youngest brother, Joel Lawrence King, and his wife and children, they live in Lansing, Michigan. So when he says that he has a lot of relatives in the city, that's what he's talking about. And so they have been coming to visit their family here for years. And then he goes on. I want you to think with me this morning from the subject, Rediscovering Lost Values. Rediscovering Lost Values. There's something wrong with our world, something fundamentally and basically wrong. I don't think we have to look too far to see that. I'm sure that most of you would agree with me in making that assertion. And when we stop to analyze the cause of our world's ills, many things come to mind. And that's from his sermon, Rediscovering Lost Values in February 28, 1954. Now, he has a much larger um, um, theme of his sermon, but when he says, you don't have to look too far to see that, what is he talking about? Well, Black Bottom has already begun to be destroyed, and you can see it from Second Baptist Church. So you already have begun to see the destruction of a significant portion of Black Bottom by 1954. And so when he says, I don't think we have to look too far to see that there's something wrong with our world, something fundamentally and basically wrong, you have a Black community being destroyed in what is a major urban renewal project in the city of Detroit, but what black people in the city of Detroit do not call urban renewal, they call it Negro removal. So five years prior to this speech, that this sermon that King is giving in 1954, the federal government passed the National Housing Act of 1949. Albert Coble was elected mayor that same year, and Albert Coble ran on a platform of housing segregation. Now you have to understand that Albert Coble is doing in Detroit what many of the Southern mayors and governors are doing down South. They're resisting any federal uh, implementation of civil rights and integration. So we know that Mayor, I mean, Governor George Wallace will say segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. We know he's going to say that in the 1960s. But before that, Mayor Albert Cobo, who's running for office in 1949, right after the Supreme Court ruled that housing segregation cannot be enforced by the government, or, they, or racial restrictive housing covenants cannot be enforced by the government, Albert Cobo runs saying, I don't care what the Supreme Court said, I'm going to enforce racial restrictive covenants. So he's basically doing the same thing that years later, George Wallace would do. And he runs for mayor, and he's going to be elected to, uh, three times as mayor of the city of Detroit. And he is going to be the mayor who will begin the destruction of Black Bottom and the dislocation of African-Americans from that community. And so King is speaking to that in the early part of that speech. Second Baptist is feeling the effects of this, of what's happening at, 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 at Black Bottom themselves while King is there. Now, King has already graduated from Crozer Theological Seminary. His doctoral dissertation has just been accepted at Boston University. He's going to go off and attend Boston University to attain his PhD. He's just gotten married about eight months ago when he comes to um, give this sermon, Rediscovering Lost Value. Coretta Scott King and Dr. King, they met in Boston in their newlyweds. While they were still living in Boston as students, there's major tension in Montgomery, Alabama around segregation on buses. King will move to Montgomery in September of 1954 and become the pastor at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And he will get involved in the Montgomery bus boycott. And again, as it was stated earlier, Second Baptist Church will send over $2,600 to the Montgomery bus boycott more than any other church in the country. They will also send over $1,500 to help the churches and homes that have been bombed in Montgomery during the boycott. Detroit is impacting King. King will come to Detroit four times in 1958. Now he is a civil rights leader. So all of those times he had come before were prior to his becoming a civil rights leader. But now in 1958, the Montgomery bus boycott has, has been successfully ended after 382 days of African-Americans refusing to ride the buses in Montgomery, Alabama, over 50,000 black people, along with a civil rights lawsuit to overturn segregation in, on the buses. So that's happened. Rosa Parks has moved to the city of Detroit by this time, and she's going to live here longer than she lived in the city of Detroit. And she's going to be an activist in the city of Detroit just as she was in Montgomery, Alabama. And so now King, will, when he comes here, he's written his book, Stride Toward Fe Freedom. And so he's organized the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And, and he was one of the leaders of the Montgomery Improvement Association, which led the Montgomery bus boycott. So King is a civil rights leader. 
he's going to come here four times in, in, in 1958. He's going to be here from March 10th through the 14th, at which he will speak at Second Baptist Church. He's going to be here May 15th and 16th. And in August, he's going to come here, and Congressman Charles Diggs is going to give King a tour of what's left of Paradise Valley. And so Paradise Valley has now begun to be destroyed. It's not totally destroyed yet. They've just begun doing that because in, the in 1956, the Interstate Highway Act is passed. And that begins Kobo of destroying Hastings Street and building the I-375 freeway in, in what was Black Bottom and the I-75 freeway in what was Paradise Valley. And the businesses, 350 Black-owned businesses in and near the area known as Paradise Valley are beginning to be destroyed. And Congressman Charles Dix is taking King on a tour of Paradise Valley. And so King, who knew something about Detroit, I mean, he wasn't unknowledgeable about Detroit, is learning a deeper lesson now about this Black business district, about this, this, the, this, this Black self-determination that's being preempted by the federal government, the state government, and the city government. And then on September 12th, he will speak at the National Baptist Convention at King Solomon Baptist Church. And he will be talking about the Montgomery bus boycott, which he has written about in his book, Stride Toward Freedom. So what he's seeing now, because he's been involved in the Southern freedom struggle in Montgomery, Alabama, and he will continue to be involved primarily in that movement for the next decade. But he's beginning to see the Northern aspects of Jim Crow or the Northern aspects of racial inequality. And he's beginning to add those ideas into his speeches and into his philosophy on how to fight for freedom for African-Americans. It is Detroit and other places in the North too, not just Detroit, that is informing King beyond the Southern freedom struggle. Black Bottom has been destroyed. Paradise Valley is now being destroyed. He's talking about the Montgomery bus boycott, but he's now getting an edu another education about how racism rears its head and how it functions in the North. Of course, we know his most famous visit to the city of Detroit is in June of 1963, when he will lead the Detroit Walk to Freedom, organized by the Detroit Council for Human Rights, um, led by Reverend Clarence LaVon Franklin, who had been pastor of New Bethel Baptist Church, which was located on Hastings Street before the freeway was built, but now, a few months before this march, he's been forced to move onto the west side on Linwood. And of course, he buys the, the church buys the Oreo Theater, which was formerly the church of Prophet Jones. And he is now organized New Bethel Baptist Church there. He is a friend of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and of course, Reverend Clarence LeVon Franklin is a legendary minister in his own right in the city of Detroit, particularly. And of course, we all know his daughter, who is even more famous than Reverend Franklin. And that, of course, is Aretha Franklin. And so um, the Detroit Council of Human Rights has organized this march down Woodward to do two things. One, to support the freedom movement in the South, particularly the March on Washington that's upcoming in the next two months, but also to highlight the, the fight against discrimination in the city of Detroit. And so King, in this speech, although both speeches end with the crescendo of um, the I have a dream portions. So he adds that I have a dream portion in Detroit before he does it in, in, in uh, Washington, D.C. But before that, the earlier part of the speech in Washington, D.C., he's talking about a check um, coming back insufficient funds and talking about the fact that Black people's freedom has never been fully realized even after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. In Detroit, although he starts with that, he's not talking about segregation on lunch counters and segregation on the buses. He's talking about housing in the city of Detroit. He's talking about the, the school system, the segregation and inequality in the school system in the city of Detroit. Um, because in that time, in the 1960s, we were not talking about educational inequality between Detroit and Gross Point, which is what we talk about today. When we talk about educational inequality today, we're talking about a predominantly African-American city and a predominantly white um, upper class or higher income um, city that has more resources for their school system. That's what Gary B versus Whitmer, the lawsuit that was just settled last year, that's what that's about. 
But in the 1960s, what we were talking about is schools on one side of the city of Detroit, which were significantly or predominantly black, versus other schools in the same city, under the same school district, with the same school board in charge of both schools that were predominantly white, that had more resources. So we weren't talking about Detroit versus Gross Point in the 1960s. We were talking about Northern versus Redford High School. We were talking about Miller versus Denby. Um, we were talking about um, Northwestern versus Mumford. And so these schools were unequal within the same school district. And King is highlighting this in his speech on June, in June of 1963 at Cobo Arena. Uh, of course, ironically, the mayor who um, was a segregationist and, and helped to destroy Black Bottom. Um, and he's talking about job discrimination, which is a major issue in the city of Detroit and in the North. Black people are the last hire and the first fire. And many of the factories are beginning to shed jobs by the 1960s, and they're shedding Black um, employees first. And of course, he's talking about police racism. A week after this, a week after he gives this speech, um, Cynthia Scott will be murdered by members of the Detroit Police Department just a few blocks from where the march down Woodward began. And so in that same, at that, after that speech, King would partner with Motown Records. And Motown Records will record the speeches of Dr. King, many of his most important speeches, and that's how they would become um, well listened to all over the country by people who weren't present at those speeches. And so Detroit is impacting King and helping King evolve his message when he's talking about freedom. Detroit moved King. On June 19th, 1966, in the middle of the, um, the March Against Fear, where James Meredith had begun a march from, from Mississippi to Memphis, and he's shot at the beginning of that march, and civil rights organizations take over the march after that, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, CORE and SNCC, they join the march and continue the march. We have the emergence of the Black Power Movement. And of course, the Black Power Movement, much of the ideology behind the Black Power Movement comes from the North. It comes from Detroit, it comes from New York, it comes from Malcolm X, who at this point has been assassinated. And so that's now affecting King and moving King in direction that he otherwise would not have gone. And of course, he's going to formulate that year his Poor People's Campaign. And he's going to be involved in the Chicago housing battle, which, of course, he's been familiarized with housing discrimination in his visits to the city of Detroit and how housing discrimination works in the city of Detroit to keep people unequal, like other forms of discrimination in the South keeps people unequal. And so now he's added that as part of his, 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 um, his chest of tools of fighting against discrimination, these issues that are happening in the North. And that's going to expand him to not just talk about nonviolence for civil rights workers, but for the country to be nonviolent in the war in Vietnam. And so by 1967, King has come out against the war in Vietnam. And by 1968, he has blasted, uh, of course, racism, militarism, particularly the war in Vietnam, and capitalism, especially the economic exploitation of the poor. And he has started this poor people's movement, which is a planned march on Washington, D.C., where poor people of all races, of all ethnic groups, will come to, the, to Washington, D.C. and really occupy Washington, D.C. until the country moved away from funding the war and began to fund the things that um, the people, working class people and poor people needed to, to, to survive. So he's come out against Northern Jim Crow at this point. He's come out against militarism. Um, about capitalist exploitation. And in 1968, he comes to the city of Detroit, or he comes to Gross Point, and he's going to give a speech. And of course, this is a speech three weeks before he's going to be assassinated. In March, he comes to, the, he comes to Gross Point. And of course, on April 4th, he's going to be assassinated. When he comes, the police chief of Gross Point sits on his lap from the airport until he gets into the high school. Gross Point South High School to speak because there's been so many threats of assassinating him that they do not want him to be assassinated in Gross Point. There are all kind of reactionary racist organizations that are, are trying to attack him, that are trying to drown him out, 
they're trying to get inside of the of the of the uh, event so that they can heckle him and 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 drown out his speech. And some of them do get in, and some of them do try to heckle him, uh, but not enough to drown out his speech. And he's talking about these two Americas, these this, these two Americas, and he's also responding to the Detroit 1967 rebellion. And he says that riot is the language of the unheard. And even though he doesn't agree with these riots, he doesn't agree with these uprisings, he understands them. He talks about how they understood, we ought to understand them because black people have been speaking out and wanting equality and they've been blocked. Particularly he's talking about what's happened in the North. And um, so now when we see that King has, by the time he's assassinated on April 4th, 1968, he's come out against Northern Jim Crow. He's come out against militarism. He's come out against the exploitation of the poor. And the reason he's moved to this point is largely a contribution of Northern black history, especially Detroit's black history. They have moved King in ways that he otherwise would not have been moved had it not been for his interfacing with the freedom struggle of activists and regular folks in and around the city of Detroit and in other Northern places. King's contribution to all of us is also our contribution or our ancestors' contribution to King himself. And so this is all part of one story and this is all part of a long freedom struggle that, that King highlighted when he visited Second Baptist Church starting with the fight against slavery which Second Baptist Church was a centerpiece of, and it continued in the Southern freedom struggle, and it continued in the Northern freedom struggle, in the Black liberation struggle, which continues to this day. Thank you for listening.